Hi, today we're going to be taking a look at another weird industrial motherboard. This time it's a PCM5890, made by a company called Advantech, who make a lot of different computers and peripherals for the embedded industrial market. If you haven't seen my video on the Ampro386 motherboard I reviewed a little while ago, then uh, I'll give you a link to it below. Um, check that out because we'll be covering some of the same concept. But just briefly, um, the reason I like these old industrial motherboards is they're very, very compatible with old legacy DOS applications because they're intended to go in factories where they'll be installed running heavy equipment that costs a lot of money and they don't want to have to upgrade the whole machine just because the PC's gone a bit obsolete. So these industrial boards are generally made with processors and technology that's a little bit older than normal. So unlike the 386 board, this isn't technically speaking a PC-104 board, although it does have this PC-104 connector. And basically, as I said before, this is an ISA slot in a different shape. Um, and we can actually convert that into ISA using some adapters that I'll show you in a minute. I believe the processor is an Intel Pentium of some description. The manual for the motherboard says it can accept anything up to a Pentium 166, although elsewhere in the same manual it says it only accepts a Pentium 133, so um, I'm suspecting this is going to be a Socket 5 board. The chipset's made by VIA, and it's a VIA Apollo Master, I believe. That's these five chips that are made by VIA. It's also got a Chips F65545. That's a video chip. Um, I don't think it's an especially good one, but um, as we're just after running DOS games, it's a 32-bit PCI chip, so it should be plenty fast for DOS games. What else have we got on here? Um, this looks like an Ethernet controller, uh, made by Realtek, and some Ethernet magnetics here, I think. Over this end, we have a couple of sticks of RAM. Don't know how many megabytes this will be, um, and a, one of these cache memory cards as well. And uh, intriguingly, it has a standard PCI slot, so that would raise the possibility of maybe adding 3D acceleration to this thing. Yeah, this looks like it could be a little bit more useful than the 386 motherboard we looked at last time, which didn't have a display controller or an IDE port on it, so we had to add an external graphics card and IDE controller. One thing it is notably lacking is any kind of sound output, so if we want sound in games, we'll have to add a sound card, but that's okay. That's not a problem at all. I have a PC-104 sound card we can add to this, or we can add a ISA to PC-104 adapter and any other sound card we like. Another good thing is it's powered by a standard 4-pin Molex connector, so it'll be nice and easy to power this. We won't have to make any adapters. So yeah, I guess we just power this thing up and see what it does. The only slight hitch in our plans is that the video output, which is here, is just a standard pin header rather than being a normal VGA port. Port. However, um, along with the board, I found this cable, which seems to adapt that pin header to a normal VGA port. Don't know where this cable came from. I'm guessing I made it because it looks pretty <laughs> bodged together. All right, I'll get my ATX power supply and plug one of the Molex plugs in there. Now the VGA cable. Right, let's fire it up and see what we get. Oh, it went beep. That's good. Got a built-in speaker. All right, so we have a Pentium 90 megahertz. That's quite a good speed for running sort of faster DOS games, so that, that's pretty good. 32 megabytes of memory, that's quite a lot for the period. Now I suppose we need to connect a boot device and keyboard to it. This is actually a 44-pin IDE connector of the kind used in laptops, so I'll need an adapter. I do have one here though, so it's 44-pin to 40-pin IDE. Make sure I don't plug in this power though, or else it'll send power back into the board and probably fry it. But I think this should work just fine. As with the 386 board, I'm going to use this IDE to SD card adapter, which are super useful. I use them in all my old PC builds, and that'll let us just put uh, an SD card in instead of a full hard drive. In addition to that, I've found this PS2 to pin header adapter and just wired that straight up to the keyboard header via some DuPont wires because the pinout wasn't exactly the same, and I've got that connected to my wireless PS2 keyboard. Looks promising. Let's try top bench. Score of 190, I'll remember that. I won't remember that. This is Phil's Computer Lab's benchmark packs. Uh, I'm not going to run them all. Let's try Doom. Doom seems to be running reasonably well. That gives us a frame rate of 23.77 frames per second. Perfectly adequate. All right, let's try Quake. All right, just looking at it, it seems reasonably quick. What did we get? Uh, 16 frames a second. That's actually lower than I thought it would be. <laughs> Maybe it's not quite so good after all. <laughs> all right, um, that's a couple of benchmarks done. Let's try installing a sound card in it. So the sound card I'm going to use is this one that I've used in previous videos. It's a PC-104 sound card that I designed for a mini DOS gaming PC called the Wii 86. But um, I've used it in a lot of other projects since, and it's been quite useful because it takes up less space than a full ISA sound card, and it means you can plug it straight into like embedded boards like this that don't have a full ISA slot. Oh, it almost doesn't fit. It's near hitting this voltage regulator but I think it will be okay yeah I think that's good just need to plug it into my mixer 
let's see what we can see or rather here unisound uh yes the driver initialized the sound card i suppose it's traditional at this point to start with doom there we go ad lib and sound great yeah this seems great anyway who cares it's doom we've seen it a million times it's time to test the sound card and chew bubble gum Adlib music doesn't sound that great. I wonder if that's because of this sound card or if it just doesn't sound that great anyway. Seems to be running very well. Frame rate's about what I can remember, a early Pentium being. That's about right. Oh, no need for that sort of language. Oh no! God damn it. Game developers do not automatically switch to the rocket launcher. Sixes and Sevens is my favourite track from uh, Theme Hospital. Funkiest bass line of all time. Hmm, maybe not in the ad-lib version. Ooh, frame rate's a bit slow as well. I'll switch it to low res mode, it's a bit higher, it's a bit higher frame rate. But now I can't really see what's going on. <laughs> ah well, whatever. Mostly just wanted to hear the music. So yeah, this, this board seems to make quite a good DOS gaming PC, but um, I think it would be remiss of me if I didn't try something that people have been asking me to do for ages, and that's try a 3D graphics card in it. Now, I tend to avoid discussing 3D accelerators too much on my channel because it's really DOS gaming I'm into, and to be honest, 3D accelerated titles normally can use as much processor power as you can throw at them. A Pentium 90 megahertz like this isn't ideal at all for even really, really early 3D accelerated games, but the fact that this board has a full-size PCI slot on it means that we might as well give it a go and just see what difference it makes to say frame rates and quake and so on. The accelerator I'm going to use is, of course, the 3DFX Voodoo. It was the first 3D graphics accelerator that was really any good, if we're being honest. And it actually works in a lot of DOS games as well as Windows, so uh, maybe we'll try some of them out. But uh, now, unfortunately, if I were to stick it straight down like this, then that would kind of ruin the kind of tiny compactness of this whole layout we've got going here. You know, it's nice and small at the moment, you know, we can fit it inside quite a small case. And if this is coming out, sticking out like right angle, to it then it's, it's not going to fit in a small case anymore. Hopefully we can get around that by using one of these right angled PCI riser cards. So theoretically I should be able to poke this down into the slot like that and then the Voodoo should be able to just go in here like that. That's actually still a fairly compact setup. It would still go in quite a small case. Yeah, we haven't really increased the footprint of this at all, so that's that's pretty good. I mean, obviously, if you're building this into a case, you'd want to, you know, build something you could screw the bracket onto and everything, but this will do just for testing, I think. We need to rewire this slightly. These first-generation graphics cards worked in a weird way in that they didn't actually have the ability to output 2D graphics, only 3D graphics. So what you have to do is you have to connect the existing graphics adapter through the Voodoo, and it takes over for 3D stuff. Now, I don't have one of their special pass-through cables. I do have one of these VGA spit roast adapters it should be okay so that's it all wired up the normal graphics output is coming into the voodoo and then that's going back out into my monitor let's see if we've broken it well uh hasn't blown up yet now i've uh, actually installed windows 98 on this off screen because most 3d accelerated games run, ran under windows even in this era so i suppose gl quake is the place we start oh hey look at that a bit higher resolution than it was on dos oh hey that works that looks actually really good yeah, it looks like GeoQuake to me. Yeah, texture filtering's all working, everything looks great. It's got the trademark GeoQuake uh, orange muzzle flash. Oh, thought so it looked really crap. All right, I'll maybe just do some benchmarks. Time demo, what is it, demo one? Is that what it's called? Yeah. Oh, it seems to be running pretty fast. And this is in a higher resolution than DOSQuake was running in as well. 21.3 frames per second. That's in 512 by 384. Let's try 640 by 480. This doesn't seem to be running that much slower than uh, 512 by 384. What do we get? 21.3. <laughs> That's exactly the same. Quake must be very, very CPU bound, I suppose. Um, I wonder if there's something we can do about that, though. Now, technically this motherboard claims to only be able to take up to a 166 megahertz processor, but the jumpers in the manual state that it should be able to do a three times multiplier at a 66 megahertz system bus. So theoretically, this should be able to take a Pentium 200 megahertz and work. Um, now, unfortunately, it is still socket five, I think. The only Pentium 200 I've got is a Pentium MMX, um, which is a socket seven processor. So technically we will be driving its core at the wrong voltage, but I think it's only about 0.5 volts extra.
extra so as long as I put a big heatsink on it and don't run it very long I think it will be okay okay that's the old one uh, okay good and our heatsink um, I'll probably put one with a fan on and unfortunately this isn't clipped or glued down so it's just gonna have to float other thing I have to do is change the jumper to tell it it's three times multiplier if it's three times multiplier only J2 should be closed well, something's happening. The fan is extremely broken, but never mind. We're getting anything on the screen. Oh, it went beep. Oh, oh. 166 megahertz, though. Um, maybe that's just because the BIOS can't recognize it. I'll boot into some programs and see if we can figure out what's going on here. Well, 236 and top bench. I don't know if that... I, I, I suppose I'll have to compare that to some other systems. Yeah, check CPU seems to think it's 166 megahertz as well. I don't know, I'll need to look at this another time. Try Geo quick again, see what kind of frame rate we got. The 3DFX intro animation looks smoother. I suppose that's a good sign. Oh yeah, I can already tell that's going faster. Oh yeah, 26.7, so a little bit faster. It's running much faster at 512 by 384 so maybe we've reached a limit of the video card now, I don't know. Alright, so that's a much higher frame rate at 512 by 384 um, so 33 frames per second. So I don't think the processor is the bottleneck anymore, but uh, yeah. So here's our benchmark results for the Pentium 200 MMX that's actually running at 166. Doom and DOS gets a modest improvement. DOS Quake gets a fairly substantial improvement. That actually sort of makes the game playable now. Just for fun, I ran Windquake at 640 by 480 but the 166 got 4.4 frames per second. I wasn't going to wait for the 90 megahertz to finish. Now, GL Quake, uh, as we discovered, um, runs exactly the same same no matter what resolution you put it on but on the 166 uh, the resolution does make a difference so I'm guessing it was CPU bound here and is now at least somewhat graphics processor bound here. It'd be interesting to see what would happen if we bumped it up again to 200 megahertz and it looks like there might be a solution for this. Apparently the Pentium MMX doesn't have logic pull-ups on its multiplier select pins so even though here uh, you can see jumper one isn't populated rather than being pulled up to a logic high it's just being left floating so I think in theory we should be able to get around that just by pulling it up manually. Looks like J8 also supplies 3.3 volts. If I wire up the control pin of J1 up to J8, then I think we should get 3.3 volts. Put it through a resistor though, just to make sure we don't have any nasty surprises. 8K1 I've just got lying around. Uh, in there, and in here. Now theoretically, we've pulled that voltage my multiplier pin up to 3.3 volts. Let's see if it makes any difference. All right, look at that. 200 megahertz. Well, it loaded faster. All right, that's 29.45. Uh, that's, uh, again, slightly better. <laughs> Quake now. Well, oh, yep, another marginal improvement. Windows 98 time. Well, oh, that's going super fast now. I think that's faster again. All right, 34.3. That's 1.3 more frames per second. Not a huge difference. Let's try 640 by 480. Yeah, 26.8. That's that's only 0.1 frames per second faster than the 166. So, yeah, I think we're reaching the point of diminishing returns here. Well, here's all our results from benchmarking the 200 MMX actually running at its correct speed. As you can see, there's not been much of an improvement, really. Um, we're talking sometimes less than a single digit improvement. It looks like we've maybe reached the limit of what adding extra processor power can get us in uh, Geoquake, certainly. But I wonder if some more advanced 3D games would benefit from the extra processing power. Ooh, there we go. Not running very well, it has to be said. All right, yeah, this is not what I would call playable. Uh, we're talking frame rate in the single digits. Nah, I'm not gonna play any further than this. It's just, nah, not, not, not feasible. So what moral can we draw from this tale? Well, the Advantech PCM, whatever it was, 5890, makes a really good DOS gaming machine if you add a PC-104 sound card to it. I tried a bunch more games off camera and compatibility and performance was very high. The 90 megahertz processor is fast enough to handle later games while not being too fast to introduce compatibility problems. And even then you can disable the level one and level two cache to slow things down even further. I can't really recommend it for 3D accelerated games though. Even when you upgrade the processor, it just isn't fast enough to run anything but the first generation of 3D accelerated games like GL Quake. And to be honest, GL Quake runs perfectly on my six month old Windows 11 laptop. So I don't 
don't know why I'd bother building a computer just to run it. I know there are Glide-only DOS games that won't run on modern PCs, but even then I'd still recommend running them on a faster computer than this. Maybe a Pentium 3 with a Voodoo 2 or 3? But who cares about all that? Old DOS games is what this series is all about, so for that purpose I reckon this board is a great choice. It plus the sound card and maybe Voodoo would fit into a nice small case and make this a lovely mini retro gaming PC. Anyway, thanks very much for watching this video. If you like it, then leave a comment, like, subscribe, you know how it works, and stay tuned for more weird industrial PC experimentation. I've got some more stuff coming up. Thanks very much for watching, and see you next time.